OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Say thank you to Luke Philly for CASA's tech support. He is our uh, expert on CASA's essay test, and I asked him to join us today. Also, thank you to Cynthia King, who is our in the room uh, room host assistant, and I totally appreciate having both of you along for the ride today. So for the next hour, we're going to be talking about the two new CASAS assessments. One is called essay and one is called language. And the title of my presentation, let me go ahead and share my screen, is four steps to improving writing skills and its ideas for implementing the CASAS essay and language tests. And the reason I, I talk about the ideas for implementing, it's not just your old, your uh, multiple choice type of test. What we found with the pilot agencies is there's a whole lot of preparation that needs to happen in order to have things go successfully, both for the proctors and the students. And I'm gonna be talking about a little bit about that. So just to start, um, we, we talk about writing and we talk about how important it is. I like to think of it as something that's not just a call to action, but it's also persuasive. It can allow people to clarify a position or document an event. I think good writing is inspirational and probably the biggest challenge to agencies in helping students to be better writers is the amount of time that it takes for a teacher to score an essay. There's also a question about ambiguity or about um, the fairness of three different teachers all scoring the same essay. Do they all come up with the same sort of a rubric or a score? And we believe that uh, what we've done with CASA's essay test is kind of a, the best of both worlds. We've used the artificial intelligence and the knowledge of teachers to train this um, auto scorer to do that work. And the great thing about it is, is it does the scoring in about four or five seconds. So sit with me for a few minutes. I'll give you a quick tour of what it's all about and share a little bit about the, um, the experiences that our pilot agencies have had. If I could, just for a minute before I dive into that little video, if you could, either in the chat or I don't, I think we've got enough people, it might be a little hard to raise hands and go around the room, but um, what is your role in adult ed? Because what I've found is when I talk about essay, that administrators have a view of, oh, wouldn't this be great for our school? And sometimes the first impression from teachers is, oh my gosh, not another assessment. <laughs> and really what the benefit that we found is that the students are the ones that really embrace this once they've gotten over the hump of taking that first uh, dive into the deep water of an essay test online. I'm also looking for ideas if you currently offer writing classes, like a dedicated writing class or Maybe it's bundled into part of your other curriculum as part of your um, reading, ABE rating, GED prep, that kind of thing. And there's lots of great comments coming here. Lots of ESL teachers, beautiful. And I'll say that the essay test is uh, geared for intermediate high and above. So if you have ESL students in that uh, ability level currently, this, these tests are for them. Okay, now Andrew, I see you're teaching beginning level students. This would be probably too hard. Um, I'll take you through a, a tour and show you a little bit about what the what the questions look like on the language test and what the essay prompt looks like. And I think I think we'll kind of agree that it takes a certain amount of a command of the language. I know when I took Spanish uh, language and literature in school years ago, that for me to be able to write an essay in Spanish took a little bit of a little bit of extra prep and ability. In, in different kinds of ways. Okay, let me go ahead and queue up this video. I'm actually really excited about it. It's, uh, I can't talk and type at the same time, but. Here it is. This is an introduction to the CASAS essay test.
<clears throat> to summarize the video, we believe that students will benefit from these different assessments and the preparation that you can deliver to them through your curriculum. It'll help your HSE candidates as they prepare for their high set or GED exams, and it'll support students who are transitioning into different roles in employment or secondary education where writing skills are required. Um, the video gave some examples about this. Now, the pilot sites did just exactly what I'm showing you here, is they grouped the students by their goals and their abilities, and they created different classes. Some needed like a short uh, workshop, others needed more of a boot camp for four to six weeks, and then others needed more of a semester long uh, writing assignment uh, to practice with things. So the next few minutes, I'm going to introduce what I call the four steps to improving writing skills. And as you know, teachers, uh, the writing skills have four basic components of assessing, preparing, assessing, instruction, and then repeating. And I like to think this is similar to what we do when we write, that we're thinking about things, and then we compose, and then we edit, and then we reread it. And it really is a cyclical kind of in nature. So I'm going to go into these four different areas and talk a little bit in more detail. When I talk about preparation, first off, for the proctors and teachers, we have documents, we have a lot of uh, materials, and that reading in preparation helps a lot. It includes screenshots and sample reports, and also includes a rubric, which is very helpful, so that you can see what the auto scorer is going to be grading you on. Also, we found that when you take an online test, I mean, thinking back when I used to use a blue book and I had to write my essays by hand and have them scored, it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit different in the world today because they're in an online word processor. Well, there's a few tricks to that. You know, do they know how to copy and paste? Do they realize that after a punctuation like a period or a comma, that there needs to be a space? Right? Because the end of a sentence with a dot with the next word starting right next to it, that's going to be scored as a typo. So these kinds of uh, essay test advisory notes are very helpful for teachers and for students to learn some of the insider uh, ways to make things better when you're taking a test. Another thing that we created at CASAS is what we call the essay e-test sampler. Okay, the e-test sampler already exists. Most of you are already familiar with it, but we've added the component called essay. And teachers can use this in the classroom because it just runs in a browser. It's not actually, you know, connected to e-test. It's not going to do any scoring, but it gives the students 10 minutes to play inside the word processor and you can kind of describe what it's going to look like. And, you know, that preparatory step, you know, it really reduces a lot of anxiety. And that was the feedback that we got from our pilot agencies that the more preparation and the you know, paint the picture for the students of what that is going to look like, it, it makes it so much better. So if they go into this tool and they click on it, it shows them what it looks like inside the SE test. It starts at the top where there's a timer up here, and this counts down from 10 minutes in the practice. In the real test, it would be 60 minutes. It gives them a prompt. Here, the prompt for the, just a sample is healthy eating habits are important, but often not followed. Why is this? What can be done about it? So that is, you know, the, the style of prompt that the CASAS essay tests use. And then below it is a box where the students are going to type their essay in. You notice that the last word, ingredients there, has a little red underline underneath it? Right. That's the spell checker caught that. And we want the students to see that so they can right click on it and correct the word. Down at the bottom, there's a directions button that they can click on to get more information, like to remind them you're allowed to use scratch paper, you know, no copying, pasting from other places. And actually, that's that's prevented because in the CASAS e-test environment, as you know, we use a secure browser, so they can't exit early or move things back and forth. All right. Um, at the very end, when they're done, they click the blue arrow, and that's it. All right, another topic of preparation, and this one came out in the pilot study as well. We found that of the 120 students initially surveyed, we asked them a question, do you think this would have been easier on you if you had better typing skills? And 63% of them said, oh yeah, we definitely could use some kind of um, 
a tool or a lab. So uh, the labs and workshops that became popular at South Bay Adult School was for students to use something like a like typingclub.com and they would take an initial test with it and get a baseline score and then the counselors would set a goal of something like maybe an additional 10 or 15 words a minute or getting up to 25 words a minute to be able to type and then they would have that typing certificate in their portfolio right which is good if you're trying to get a job thought i'd just share that little piece of information that came up as part of the of the study so those are the, the slides I have for preparation. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share or comment on? Or should I keep plowing into the next section, which is the actual writing assessments? Looking for hands or comments? OK. All right, let's look. The second step, assessment. SA is looking at how writing flows. There's a hand back here. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see. Let me go ahead and stop sharing for a minute. Okay, yes, please, can you share? Okay, well, no, not to share, it's just a question. In the preparation, do you have materials that um, help the students develop the writing in the way that the CASA test is going to be graded? Does that make sense? Like, what are, what are, what are the things that, that the, the, whatever software is being used to grade it is looking for? And are there materials to help teachers teach that? Uh, so the question was, what are the what curriculum do we recommend, or do we have any materials that we suggest? And yes, that answer is coming in the third section. We have um, we've been gathering suggestions from agencies in the pilot program, and we are open if there are other ones you have. Uh, I'll kind of just jump ahead to answer your question because I hate to get le left. Uh, when I ask a question, they tell me to wait. I hate to wait. Um, within Casas, we have Quick Search Online, and that has the ability to look up keywords like. Um, conclusion or inference, which is, you know, two, two important things when you're writing, if you're trying to go for a, a high level essay uh, created. Um, we also have um, one of our agencies like the, it's called uh, pre, pre GED writing one and two by new readers press. And we have another school that said, we're going to write our own. And I have a link coming up to share for you with that one. It was called Hook, Line, and Sinker. I love that title, which is talking about how to write an introduction that hooks the audience. And uh, I do have a copy of that PowerPoint on casas.org. We can get that for you if you're interested. It's posted in the, uh, if you go to casas.org and you click on the National News and Updates webinar, you'll find that PowerPoint in there. Is that a start? Sure, sounds great. Okay, super. Go back. Thank you for your question. So the essay test and the language test, I like to think of them as complementary, where the essay test is looking at the lyrical flow of the language, the creative part of it, and the, the essay is. And then the language test is more of the, the grammar and mechanics down at the lowest level. Um, the, it's, Language test is 20 multiple choice questions, 20 minutes in a sort of a sentence completion format, fill in the blank. That's also scored immediately and there's a report. We're gonna get into the reports in uh, four slides. So I, I showed you what the essay test sort of looks like and what a sample question looks like. Let's take a look at a couple of the sample questions from the language test. The chef, Cook, cooks, cooks, meals at the restaurant. Okay, cooks. This is an example where um, a question is aligned to the verb category in the report. The language is looking at nouns, verbs, phrases, and punctuation. Okay, let's look at another one. Okay, so the class that he signed up for begins in the spring. This is a question that's aligned more to the clauses category of the report. Um, again, going back to which ones of the, which students these questions would apply for, I think you might agree with me that they need to at least be probably a, a higher intermediate and up ESL student to be able to grasp these kinds of constructs. The 
the pilot sites that use the essay and language tests, the, as far as timing is concerned, that's kind of leading into my next, my next slide. Um, let me hold that thought for a second. This is inside the e-test configuration screen. Any proctors or e-test coordinators out there? This should look familiar to you, right? So we added three different essay prompts, and we also added the language test. And that language test is, we have great vision, great high hopes for it to be expanded into multiple levels with multiple you know, pre and post test forms. As of now, it's labeled a field test because we don't have the full battery that we normally would launch in a, in a CASAS uh, um, test suite. But this is what you do. You basically, just like any other e-test, you go in, you start the test, your students log into the testing stations and they start to write. And as essay test runs under e-tests, it creates that secure environment. So students can't copy materials from a website or another source, and they can't exit while taking the test. Then when they're done, the personal score report is displayed. Then you start the language assessment and get that report. I like doing both of them at the same time. Even though we allocate 60 minutes for the essay test and 20 minutes for the language, we found looking at over 200 um, essays in the pilot and language, they don't take that long. Most students will finish up, you know, a, a decent two paragraph, three paragraph essay. They can crank that out in a half an hour. And when they go to take the language test, that's usually maybe only 15 minutes, just for planning sake. Okay, so here's the essay personal score report. It's got a little green bar, looks familiar. It's got the student's name and information up at the top, and it gives them a score. Um, I remember waiting, the, the frustration of waiting for my essays to be scored by my teachers, and it would take like days. And these, it pops up immediately as soon as they're done with the test. Huge improvement. It's not just a pass or fail. It's anywhere between one and four as the score. Um, an inadequate essay is given an asterisk, kind of along the same lines as the other CASAS tests. And at the bottom of each report, there's a specific areas for improvement, which is on this slide. Main idea, organization, word choice, grammar and mechanics. It's divided up into those areas. So anybody who scores a two, let's say, would be given a set of suggestions on what it would take to get to the next level, a three. Let's dive into a little bit more on the bottom item here, the grammar and mechanics, because this is the part that the language test really gets into. It breaks this up into a finer granularity. So grammar is the structure of language, where mechanics refers to the rules of written language, such as capitalization, spelling, that kind of thing. So when we run the language test, you'll see that that report reflects that with nouns. I'm looking at the language content areas, nouns, verbs, phrases, and punctuation. And the way that I recommend teachers look at that is they go over to the far right and they look at the percentage correct. And they look at the areas, like the ones I've highlighted here, where the student needs the most work. There's also a CCR language level, which is helpful for you to pick out the right curriculum level for the student. So this is the end of my section, second section, which is to sort of summarize that the way you use these two reports, you have a student that's got a comprehensive roadmap on areas that you need to concentrate on to help them to improve their writing. All right. So the next section, we're going to talk about how to teach writing. And again, keeping in mind the student populations, it could be ABE, NS, uh, NRS levels two and up, and ESL high, intermediate, and advanced. Um, there's more than one way to teach writing. Uh, again, old school, I used to use an outline. I'd get a piece of paper and I'd start drawing things on a piece of paper and I would come up with an outline and then I would switch to the keyboard or whatever and start creating it. I find the Generation Z students, they go straight for the keyboard. So we have to consider how we're going to teach them. Are we going to teach them to look at the prompt and pick out keywords? Are we going to teach them to, to grab phrases? Um, I know writer's block is a real thing for a lot of people. Um, so that's something that will we need to be considered in how they're going to effectively use their time. I mean, the pressure of a time test sort of is created by just saying the fact that it's a timed test and they don't know what the topic is and that that adds to some of the anxiety. 
However, I think that, that you'll find that the benefits outweigh some of the initial sort of discomfort. These were uh, tools that I mentioned a moment ago about inference and conclusion, the uh, introductory hook, line, and sinker uh, PowerPoint from Andrew and Kay Hartley, I think she's in the audience here, she's going to be teaching at the CASA Summer Institute in just a couple months, some more ideas for writing skills. So hats off to that group. And again, the New Readers Press pre-HSC Writing 1 and 2 was the other uh, tool that I mentioned. Can you share your slideshow? So we have slide yes, absolutely. Did I already do that once? Let me see. There it is. Tinyurl.com slash casas hyphen essay. So to kind of bring it all together, we're talking about this cyclical nature of composition, which is writing and editing and rewriting. And hopefully this has given you a little bit of a, a sneak preview on how the CASAS assessments could be used in that environment. Uh, we'll be planning a few more in-depth presentations in April. So if you're interested in doing that, please send an email to me, jfarah at casas.org, and I'll get you onto the list for that. Um, we do have field testing opportunities for other tools, but these are the two that today I'm super excited to be sharing with you about. And now I'll kind of take a little break before I get into the, some weird techie stuff. Um, if you have any questions so far. Yeah. Yeah, um, Cynthia, do you have any, any questions there in room, uh, is that 209? No. I, have, I do have one. Oh, one question. Hi, Janice. Hi. I can't see you, but I can hear you. For love and care, question, Janice. Um, this particular assessment is more for in-class information and not necessarily for placement purposes. Or how, and if it is for placement during an intake, how would you use that in combination with a uh, life and writing or life and reading, life and work? Goal series. Excellent question. So uh, the question is, would you use this test for intake purposes? And if so, how would you uh, go ahead and how would you use that for blending it in with the other levels? Um, let me just kind of throw that one out to either Barbara or Kay or Portia. If either of you three possibly have a, a suggestion on that one, I, I have a couple ideas, but let me just ask the California program specialists if they wanted to to tackle that, I don't know. Ladies, no? Well, I know that one of the adult schools were considering using that in place of the oral assessment. And they felt that that preparation step by taking a student that hasn't been through any of the preparation discussion about, you know, be sure to put a space after the period or, um, you know, how to manipulate an online word processor, that that was asking a little too much for a lot of students, that they wanted to spend a little bit of time with them to prepare them before putting them into the essay test. Um, so the agencies that I talked to had already put the students through an appraisal and uh, had already level tested the students before the essay was administered. Wouldn't it be challenging to figure out um, if they're at, at, at a high enough level before administering it? I mean, it seems like you might be uh, putting them up for failure if you gave it to them without, you know, discerning whether or not it's in a, at an appropriate level. Yeah, but see, my 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 thought is it's primarily for in, instructional. Uh, information rather than for placement, and and that's what I'm hearing from you, Kay. Yes. 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 Definitely. I yeah. mean, it's it's real. If, for instance, you had an ABE class or a pre-GED class where they're preparing for the test, it'd be an excellent tool to determine whether or not they're beginning to approach readiness for essay writing for the test. But for for standard ESL, I think it would be a real 
um, daunting experience if they haven't had, you know, been appropriately leveled before they took it. I would think that I would think that you would want to, especially for your ESL learners, you would want to find out how literate they are in their native tongue and go from there because some some students are, you know, have advanced education in their their um, native tongue, but yet they're still struggling with English. But and a lot of um, a lot of those students can write much better than they could speak. So okay. it could help you that way as well. Thank you, Barbara. Great. Do you think, one more question do you, to the group, do you think the language assessment, the shorter language one, that one would be, seem to be more helpful for placement for the, right? The, the, yeah. the grammar one, correct? Right? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. So the question is, would the language test, uh, would it help if I showed that, that report again so that you know what that looks like in case you're not uh, this one? I would think this would be very informative for you as a teacher and for the student, especially if they are um, educated in their, in their native tongue or your advanced um, ABE, AS, your advanced ASE student. There's also a question in the chat from uh, Kara Lazarus asking, can it be used as a post-test for moving up a level? Answer to that is no, it's not considered a post-test. Remember, a pre and a post-test have to be of the same modality. And the CASAS essay test isn't one of the ones that is already approved by the NRS as having a pair. That's something that we're going to talk about, you know, going forward once we have more agencies that have administered it and we have more statistics, we're hoping that we can use it as a predictor for success for the GED tests because of the writing component that's part of the RLA within GED, but we need a lot more data and more time to be able to come up with that kind of a, a reference. Okay, um, there's a question here. I'm sorry? There's a question here in the room. Yes, go ahead. So one of my uh, instructors who teaches uh, HiSET, we just started implementing computer-based testing because of the problem with HiSET. Uh, but with one of the problems she's running into is that the students are used, so used to, and I think it came out in your example, seeing the underline of the error. How can we prepare or what can we do so that the students like not depend so, because that's been one of the challenges that the student is so used to seeing, oh, there's a grammar error, there's a spelling error. So in their mind, they're like, oh, it's on the computer. So that it's going to show me the mistake. So how or what advice would anyone in the room or online suggest for us to try to relay the message to the student? Because we've tried, apparently it's not been successful, but that they're not going to see that. Or is there a practice tool, kind of like what you show, that's not going to show the errors of the student to kind of start training them that it's not going to show you your errors. I don't know if you're not making sense. It's not going to underline the mistake. Yes. It's not going to underline the self or right. grammar error. Yes. So um, as you recall, when I showed the the e-test sampler, that mm -hmm. that shows that as they're typing and they get that red underline that they need to right click to change to fix the spelling mistakes. If you had a Chromebook and you turned on the uh, spell checker, invariably you also get a grammar checker and that's a blue line underneath. Um, agencies have to kind of decide if they want to have that turned on or not. And we think it's a kind of an unfair advantage to give the student a grammar checker and then they find themselves on a high set, you know, environment, testing environment and they don't have that anymore. So the one agency that has Chromebooks in their e-test lab decided to turn off both the spell checker and the grammar checker. Cause it's like, you know, buy one, get one free within the Chrome environment. It's not a problem on windows, um, but that's how Chrome imp implemented their, their spell checker. Uh, any other, any ideas from the field? I mean, this is a panel, panel discussion and I'm so glad that all of you are here and so many of you are teachers. Um, yeah, Andrew's comment about autocorrection to be turned off by the uh, individuals. It's not actually autocorrection, it's merely flagging 
the error. It's not doing any autocorrect for them. Uh, and thank you, Luke, for make, uh, saying more eloquently than I did about the correlation with the other modalities. Thank you. Kind of an interesting fact I picked up. Um, so the agencies did a lot of their, in the pilot, they did a lot of their pre-tests on their, on their students, the reading, and then they gave them the essay tests around the like October, November, December timeframe. And now I'm circling back with them and saying now, so they're in their writing classes now, they're in their boot camp, they're in their workshops. What are you gonna do for the retest? And it kind of brought up a really interesting bunch of questions. Is it valid? And is it actually beneficial to give the student the same essay question after the writing assessment uh, instruction is completed to see how they do with the same question in terms of their use of words, in terms of their, their, the flow, the grammar, the punctuation, would that be the way that you and your agencies would use it to retest on the same of the three prompts? So if you started with the first one about, uh, I think one one's about employment, one's about um, a kind of a health sort of a thing, and then one's about consumer skills. Would you, well, I, I'll just kind of give you the answer for the essay. The pilot site that I was working with is they said, we want to test on the same prompt. We want to see what they do with it. It's not like they're memorizing a bunch of answers. We want to see how they've matured in their writing style. And that way that they can kind of cycle through that and, and see if they've gone from a one to a two or a two to a three. Maybe they've made a mega jump and gone from a one to a four. You know, we don't, we're, we're still waiting for that uh, data to become available to us on the retest. Janice? Yes. I would think that the student would really like to see that, to see their own progress. I think that would be a really um, inspirational for the student himself or herself. Good point. I like that. You're right. Because I know when I, I used to, you know, I'd get back my, my essay and it'd be redlined and, you know, the teacher would sit next to me and she'd go, okay, this is what you need to do differently. And she would send me back and I would have two more weeks or a week and I would have to redo it. And then I would come out with something that was so much better than the first one I did. And that's just such a, the joy of a teacher, really, the, to watching the student mature from where they were into their new abilities. Yeah, that is the writing process. Uh, Angela, to answer your question, when the student is in the essay test, yes, they are shown the spelling mistakes. No, they are not shown the grammar mistakes. The one caveat is the way that Chrome has, the Chromebooks have implemented it, which is you either get both of them or you get neither of them. Okay. A uh, question from Danielle. After they take the essay test, can we as teachers view what they wrote? Am I being recorded? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a giant. Okay, I'm going to take off my CASAS hat for a second. That's that's a giant debate within CASAS. How much, you know, how much we're going to open up the entire uh, database to let people pull out chunks of text. Um, so currently, yes, you can see what they wrote. I don't know if they're going to lock it down or not in the future, but as of today, you can go into Tops Pro Enterprise, you can go into the tests, you can find the student in the test, and you can bring up their text. Okay, pass this hat back on. <laughs> but that's just, that's how we've implemented it so far. And that was how we found the mistake with the, with the punctuation, with the no spaces after the periods. The, one of the agencies called me and she goes, this student, Janice, is so capable, we can't believe she got an asterisk. I went, what? So I have some magic that you guys don't have that I can actually do e-tests and copy and paste from other places outside of the secure browser. So I, I grabbed the student's essay out of TE, plopped it in there, and then scored it, and I got an asterisk. And then I put spaces after all her commas and, and periods. And it was a beautiful essay. It was like, you know, four paragraphs long, nice choice of words. She got a three already, just from making that one kind of important correction. And I mean, if you think about it, she's got maybe 18 sentences total in three paragraphs. And every one of those ones ended up with a weird word with a dot in the middle of it. And that was enough to throw the auto scorer into thinking that that wasn't a great essay. I have a question, please. 
Does it weight the grammar versus the content? Ah, there's lots of magic in them, our noodles. Yes, there's all kinds of weighting about um, which things are more important. Do, does, is the punctuation more important than the creative use of words? And that's all part of the, the AI behind the scenes. But I do have a few things to share with you if you uh, want to go into the chat GBT discussion. <laughs> GBT. Anybody well, familiar with that? Go ahead. In my opinion, speaking and writing, there should be a huge emphasis on content, and we can kind of overlook the the small little errors because are you understanding the individual writing and speaking, and do spend time not you but us as a group going backwards to picking apart all these little details? I think is unfortunate, and your example highly um, highlights that. Fantastic. I mean, let's give her eighty percent on content and 10, 15, 20% on the other, in my opinion, but I'm not an expert. I, I see your point 100%. And all I can say is that's something that I would take back to, to the, my development team and take back to uh, a few others to discuss a little bit more that the value, the weighting on content versus little nitpicky things like punctuation. Um, for now, all I can say is that the amount of hundreds of hours of training, let me kind of go back to the, a couple of those slides um, that have gone into training those three prompts that we've prepared so far would suggest that um, just a little bit of that advisory document that I shared earlier saying that, you know, these are a few tricks that you need to teach your students so they score highly on the test. This is, these are just a few things that they'll need to know because if you forgive them and then they get to the high set test or the GED test and it's not as forgiving, there's going to be a disappointment there. So unfortunately, teaching them the way that an online scoring algorithm works, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit of a dinosaur at the beginning, but it's it will serve them in the long run. And it's really not too hard to, to teach those little tricks. But I hear you loud and clear. Content is super important. I mean, look at the stuff that, you know, the kids are texting each other and it's almost unintelligible, but it's not unintelligible, right? It would fail an essay test, but it would, it conveys meaning. I had a, had a class in college. What is the meaning of meaning? You know, UCLA Linguistics 601. And we sat around and talked about what is meaning? I get that. Any other questions in the chat that I've missed? Let's see. You want to see the last few slides I have for... Um, because this is the technology and distance learning and technology being uh, the big word there, I prepared a couple slides that I didn't share with the national audience just to kind of talk a little bit more about the technology behind the, uh, oh, let me skip ahead, the auto scorer. I talked briefly about the algorithms and the way that we pre-train the prompts. We used um, CASAS program specialists, we used experts, We've been using these prompts within our NEDP, National External Diploma Program, uh, which is popular in a lot of states besides California. We share with you the scoring rubric and just kind of give you the advice that these are the things that go into the auto scorer. And we feel that the fact that it's it, it'll, it doesn't have any teacher bias, not that you guys are biased, but the, the bias of what one teacher might grade as an A versus an A minus versus a B plus, this thing is a machine. <laughs> and you give it the same essay 15 times, it will give you the same score. And there's a consistency that comes with that that some, are, some find as, as beneficial. Here's a question I got from one of the agencies. How lenient is the auto score? How hard is it to get a four? So, <laughs> the good student, I sat down and I wrote a bunch of essays. I wrote a good Janus quality, you know, hard, good, I got a four on it. And then I backed it off a little bit and I got it to, I got a three and then I made some mistakes and I took out a paragraph and I got it down to a two and I got it down to a one. And then I messed around with it a little bit to see what kinds of things it flags for an asterisk score, like um, too short, too many certain types of errors, you know, violent speech. So there's a, there's a bunch of things that are included in the rubric, which describe the things that it would give it an asterisk. But um, I found that it's not easy to score a four. And if any of you have heard about chat GPT, which is a little online tool, it's free currently. Students are kind of uh, 
using it a lot, especially in the community colleges. I hear about that a lot. Um, so anyway, you feed it a prompt and it gives you some information that's snooped out of the internet and different places. So I took the CASAS essay prompts and I fed it to ChatGPT. And sure enough, I gave it that, you know, healthy eating habits are important prompt. And it, it produced this little, you know, couple paragraphs of essay. And then I took it and I fed it to the auto score. What do you think it got on it? Two. Wow. Yeah. So it's looking for something good. And uh, I like to think of it as a pretty tough 11th grade English teacher. <laughs> and, okay, full caveat, if I had changed the prompt around and I had told it to do something like print, uh, create a collegiate level essay on healthy eating habits, which include, it probably would have put out something a little bit more, uh, a little more, more collegiate level. But the yeah. fact that you can take the prompts and you can feed it to ChatGPT and it only scores it to you gives me a feeling that we are going into some level of detail that is uh, exhaustive and uh, analytical. Let's see. Oh, here's a couple of references which are included in the PowerPoint. There was a great presentation by Christy Reyes of Miracosta College, part of the Lunch with Lyric, talking about ways to teach writing in a collaborative way with cool online tools. I loved that presentation. Also, um, TESOL, they had a note starting on page 60 about advice for teaching writing to, uh, to students. Those are, I thought, probably two helpful things. I'm watching the clock. I want to go ahead and suggest that if any of you want more information, you can always email me, jfera, F-E-R-A, just one R, at casas.org. You can uh, talk to your teachers and administrators, and if you think this is something you're really interested in, reach out to tech support. That's uh, Luke and his, his gang, and they will be able to install the, um, the different sessions on your e-test sessions. Remember, that was that slide we looked at here. They'll be able to install those for you and get you set up with all the copies of the documentation. There's oodles and oodles. There's a, uh, the rubric. There's a frequently asked questions, which is kind of a short thing that I would send up to your administrators if you're trying to explain to them the benefits of it and, and kind of the short of how it works. Then there's a document that's also posted that's, uh, we call it the TAD internally, I can't even, Test Administration Directions. We just, and that's got screenshots, sample reports, it's got the verbiage that a teacher would say to the students as you're sitting down, getting ready to take the test uh, assessment. Lots of information in there. It's been reviewed twice. It's had two different whole revision cycles since we started the pilot. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with the, the state that it's in right now as being you know, good and comprehensive. And those are all um, available through the tech support or on casas.org. So I wanna thank you for joining with me today. We're thinking about writing and thinking about ways that your students could possibly benefit from having that skill set in their in their arsenal as they go out into the world and go into the next things. If you have any comments or questions, reach out to me, please, jfera at casas.org. And we have a couple more minutes before we're going to say goodbye. So if anyone wants to stick around, I'd be glad to, to chat with you and answer any questions. And that's pretty much it. I want to say thank you to Cynthia for room hosting there in room 209 and Luke Philly for being in the chat. Thank you all.